Barley is also a big crop, although I would argue that barley is not quite as uh, familiar to, to most. But we have a really powerful global center for barley research in this province. It's called the, uh, uh, sorry, what is it called? Yes, the uh, Field Crop Development Center. It's in Lacombe. Flavio Capitini is head of research and a barley breeder at that institution. Please welcome him now. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, incredible meeting. Uh, I, they are setting up my presentation. I think it was a, a glitch there, but um, I'd like to talk. Hello. Yeah, now the microphone is working. Okay, yes, I, after I was invited to this presentation, I didn't realize the challenge of summarizing 12,000 years in 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'll try to talk a little bit fast here, but uh, this is uh, my business about producing, helping producing food. And the plant breeding started pretty much with agriculture. That's why I, uh, 12, 12 14,000 years ago, when the first growers started to select seeds, to have a better crop in the next generation. And uh, like uh, Jay already introduced that, we have two more billion people to feed uh, by 2050, and uh, we have to produce uh, enough food for them. So uh, I'd like to quote one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Norman Bollard, is the Greenpeace, uh, Green uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize of 1972. And he says, you can build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. And that's when you see price of food going up, you can see those uprisings and probably the Arab Spring was related with the high price of food on 2011. So that's how important it is to have enough food. And I'd like to take the case of example of barley. That just happened to be the crop I know the most. And uh, this is the fifth most grown crop in the world and among the most cosmopolitan of the crops. They are grown from the equator to Alaska and uh, is highly resilient. It is usually the last crop you can see before you get into the desert. So it's a very important crop. And it uh, has so many uses from annual feed, human food, malt for whiskey and beer, and bioproducts like uh, uh, value uh, some microfibers and other uses, industrial uses. And you can see barley at around 5,000 meters above sea level. Here we are at 3,500, but see these patches in the top of the Andes, you are around 5,000 meters, so it's among the last crops that grow at that altitude. And like many other crops here in Canada, they haven't, they haven't originated here, it comes from the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. And uh, that's, uh, have, so that has been uh, deployed all around the world and improved in different areas. It has to be adapted to different countries. And uh, it's also known to be one of the main foods of the gladiators. And they uh, gave it the stamina, the energy, and uh, the good health that they had to go. And some people, uh, we can see that Bali also gives some better flavor to the meat, and maybe the lions were appreciating that also. <laughs> so there are so many types of barley. They have two, six row, mostly used for malt, and six row, most, mostly for feed and forage. You have barleys that are uh, hulled or naked and covered, you have barleys that have special uses for forage. So, and that's a part of the introduction. I like also was asked to give some history, my history, my background and how I came to Canada. I would like to say that I, I was born in a little town in southern Brazil that's uh, most, mostly, mostly German immigrants. And you can see that was a place where in Brazil they make the Oktoberfest. It's like a little Germany, and I think that probably has shaped a little bit my career for the future. <laughs> see, they have a big meat producers. You can see huge barbecues they make there, and that also probably influenced the passion I have for my profession. Then when I was 15 years old, my mother is from Uruguay. I moved to Uruguay and I did my bachelor in agronomy there. Then I started working right away in the oldest 
uh, agricultural experiment station in the Latin America, is the Les Tanzuela, and I was right away uh, given the responsibility of barley breeding. And then I, I was been working that since then. And then after four years of working in Uruguay, releasing few varieties, I had to go to the University of Minnesota, do my master's and PhD, and then right after that, I started working for the international research centers. I was based in Mexico first, and then I moved to Syria later. <clears throat> That's a network of international centers that do agricultural research. That's where the Green Revolution started. And uh, one of my main mentors was, uh, I mentioned, Nobel Peace Prize, Norman Bolo. This is my advisor, Don Rasmussen. And then I was able to release some varieties that you're probably trying in the, when you try the Mexican beers now. They are really popular in Mexico. Then I moved to Syria, to Jordan, and then I finished in, three years ago in <laughs> Canada. So I have to be, uh, I think I kind of inherited that resilience, you know. But th that's not the point. I have been able to that, in all, traveling all around those countries, in see how passionate researchers are about breeding. And I have seen my colleagues in Tunisia, Mozambique, Ethiopia, see all are proud of their, produce, their products, Algeria, India, in China, Ecuador, Morocco, and Peru. And then I came to the Field Crop Development Center, a great team of researchers that are really doing a great job for Canada in the world. And the mission is to develop enhanced cereal crops for feed, malt, food, and by industrial uses. It's incredible. And then I always like to say everything starts here. This summer when the Canadian people have ex will be exercising their passion of uh, having a barbecue, drinking a beer, or eating some bread, have to see that all of that has to start with a good variety. So, also so many products we are not aware that are branded like a Parma prosciutto, the Parmesan cheese, or a good marbled like Wagyu beef or, or Kobe, those are sanct, sanct, possible thanks to barley. Barley is that gives that distinctive quality to those products. And you see also it's political related. Beer is the most popular of, of the drinks. You know it's always related, can have even political implications as you can see that. Obama makes beer in the White House. And uh, the perspective is that's going to continue. So uh, that's good for us. So I think that's a good thing. So we have a conventional program, you know. We start by crossing. That's our main program. We have to build genes that give that yield and quality. And that also we have a biotech lab that we can see the genes or try to see the genes and do accumulate those better genes. That's genetics. And for that we have a 50, 60,000 plots every year that you have to select. And if you're lucky, one variety is going to go out there from there every each year. So that's basically our job. And the center has been very successful. It has been almost more than one variety per year. And we work there with wheat, triticale, and all kinds of barley, as I mentioned. So the objective is we have to get better yields, better agronomic types, so the growers are able to grow it enhance quality and resistance to economy, protect that with better disease resistance and make it sustainable. We work also for better use of fertilizers with nitrogen use efficiency, better use of water. So those are the kinds of diseases we can see. Now, the, the, the last one that's striking here is the Fusarium head blight. So there are many diseases that you have to protect and find genetic resistance for that. And international collaboration. That's our own sample of the places we are continuously exchanging seeds, knowledge, and uh, trying to use in that to improve. So it's a vast uh, network of researchers that help us to do our job better. And then we protect all what we get in the gene banks. This is an example, the vault in the Svalbard, is uh, where we, they're keeping all most of the seed of this world in case of uh, apocalypse comes, at least it will be saved in there. It's in northern, it's an island in northern Europe. And this is our job. We have to increase yields. I say here in 1962, you can see that the, Canada has done a very good job in increasing yields. 
It started from a little bit above one ton per hectare in 62, and now we are close to four tons per hectare in average. So it has been increasing at a higher rate than, than the world. And that's what our job is, has to be, to produce more and better food. And it, that's the world in Canada, but here is our program. We have to continually assess what our program is doing. And see all the varieties released since 1982, you can see that there has been a tremendous increase. In, the, in this case, we say it's 50% due to genetics and 50% due to agronomy. And in here is basically only this example is genetics. And you can see that the, the different types of crops, we have here the whole or naked, the uh, two row and the six rows, but all of being around 2% of increase every year. If we keep doing that rate of increase, we will be able to, uh, to keep feeding the world in the near future. Canada is the fourth highest producing barley country in the world. And is also, here is where the barley is growing in Western Canada. You see Alberta grows 50% of the barley of whole Canada. And even in those high latitudes, you can see from the border to the high latitudes, you can find barley. And now the next challenge, you see, we have in our breeding program, we have always uh, having challenges. And this is the craft brewing industry is increasing very much, but it's also a big opportunity because it uses more than 50% more barley than the regular beer. So that's uh, some of the examples of the challenge we have in the near future. We are very happy to have that. And for that, we need a very specialized team, well-trained, committed, and passionate about the work. So we have been, that's why we have been able to have those, all those good results. The Field Crop Development Center in Lacombe is really, really. And, but we don't work, see, alone. But see, the conclusion is the crop improvement is a continuous and a cumulative process. You don't see that many things you do now, we are going to see 10, 20 years from now. So it has to be a cumulative. It's a, needed a big national, international collaboration. We collaborate with other, the other programs in Canada, in Brandon, in Saskatchewan. Several disciplines interact and coordinate where they have to have biotechnology, pathology, biology, agronomy, everything. And we are making progress, but more needs to be done. It has to be really, it's very important to keep investing in research. And fortunately, you have a good group of stakeholders and, and people that believe in us, especially Alberta Innovates Biosolutions. They have been a big believer, and we really appreciate all the support and the brainstorming sessions we have with Cornelia, with Virginia, with Guinea, and others here. So is that bad? We are being able to keep doing our work in that way. And thank you, and sorry if I, the 12,000 years went too fast. So, um, Flavio, Oldis mentioned uh, impacts on wildfire from apparent climate change over the last few decades. And you said that barley is, is a crop that can grow in fairly marginal areas. And your map showed it can go right up to the top. So do you anticipate that if uh, climate continues to warm, that barley production will be able to spread significantly northward? Uh, well, I said the barley is, uh, is the, the crop for climate change. It can, you know, really get adapted, can be bred for especially non, very suboptimal regions. And I think that uh, we have to, uh, we have that work to select the best varieties to those environments. I think Bali is the crop that has a higher probability of, of getting adapted to, to low, you know, drought, uh, uh, heat tolerance, salinity, all, all other kinds of limitations. Thanks again. Love it. Thank you.